Tooniverse was a Korean channel that focused on showing cartoons like Hamtaro, dubbed versions of Spongebob, and other shows aimed at kids and young adults. <laughs> It started out in December of 1995, and since then, the network has now become one of the largest networks for kids in South Korea. But in 1998, a video game from the US launched on the PC and Mac OS called StarCraft, and that whipped people into a frenzy. He is gonna get them in there and possibly even set down some mines and get a lot more damage done as they try to come back and rebuttal on this. In just one year, not only did the game become the most played PC game of its time, it also sparked the Tooniverse channel to do something unprecedented. Broadcasting on television the very first professional game of StarCraft Brood War with the Tooniverse programmer Korea Open in 1999. On a kids channel of cartoons showcasing a video game competition that most kids in their age demographic probably couldn't even understand at the time, but it was there and with it sparked something that would change the world of video games as we know it. The best compete in professional leagues, sometimes in Olympic-sized stadiums, playing in weekly tournaments broadcast on TV channels dedicated to this sport. That program on a children's network became the Star League and was where On Game Net or OGN first got started. And all of that happened from this. This single game that prompted a kids network to broadcast a video game to their audience. Why are they wearing these golden jackets? I don't know. And spoiler alert, we're probably never going to find out. Anyways. During the 90s, video games had undergone a tremendous boom. Any normal person would want to beat the machine. <laughs> and you come back? Oh, sure. Again? Oh, sure. <laughs> Again? <laughs> yeah. Coming from the 80s golden age of arcade cabinets that swept the nation, companies like Nintendo and Sega already started to dominate the home game video market with the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. However, another contender for the home video game market started to grow with the steadily increasing availability of personal computers. Consumers were able to purchase PCs at a lower rate, giving video game companies more room when it came to not only distribution, but also more flexibility. Not being restricted to a console, PC games were starting to find more and more people to attract. The home personal computer went from being a home computer to do simple tasks and bookkeeping to creating a market as an entertainment system. Now, home computers already had access to video games like Doom and Wolfenstein all the way back in 1992 and stretching even further into the text-based interactive fiction game genre like Zill. Among the companies growing during the boom of video games was Blizzard Entertainment, who had previously been working under the name Silicon and Synapse, creating ports for the PC like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings Volume 1, and then changed their name to Chaos Studios before being acquired by Davidson and Associates for $6.75 million, which would be $11.8 million in modern times where they finally changed their name to Blizzard Entertainment. After the acquisition, Blizzard would go on to create two market hits with Warcraft Orgs and Humans and Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness before releasing StarCraft in 1998. And although StarCraft was a smash hit, especially when introducing the expansion of Brood War, Orcs and Humans and Tides of Darkness were the building blocks to creating one of the most iconic video games of all time. Warcraft Orcs and Humans was Blizzard's first attempt at the real-time strategy market, although it wasn't the first in the genre. In 1990, Sega published Herzog's Way which I really hope I'm not messing up the name of, and if I am, I, I am so sorry. Herzog 2 yeah, you know, we're, we're just going to use this. Herzog 2. German for Duke 2, even though there was really no relation to the Duke series at all, on the Sega Genesis to the North American market, becoming widely known as the first real-time strategy video game, according to IGN and ARS Technica. 
Herzog 2 was a pinnacle moment in the real-time strategy genre of video games and was recently re-released on the Nintendo Switch, a game where you control a mechanized transformer moving from place to place while battling against your opponent that's either an AI or a friend through a split screen. It influenced the more iconic titles of its time like Dune 2, Command and & Conquer, and Warcraft. Orcs and Humans was the first IP that Blizzard was successful with, selling over 100,000 copies in its first year, making it a competitor to Westwood Studios' Dune 2. And it's because of this rivalry the RTS genre exploded during the 90s to mold the genre into the current form that we know of today. You had Total Annihilation, Age of Empires, Dune 2, Command and Conquer, Warcraft, Orcs and Humans, Warcraft 2, Ties of Darkness. All of these titles competed for the market's attention and through this rivalry, StarCraft was born. According to Patrick Wyatt, one of the key programmers on StarCraft, at the time of production, Blizzard had just finished working on Warcraft 2, Tides of Darkness, another RTS game that paved the way for StarCraft's launch, and the company still had to find ways to pay the salaries of the people who were still working at the company. At the time, sales for the PC industry were not large compared to today's standards, and so video game PC companies had to constantly move on to the next project to keep their doors open. For reference, Warcraft 2 sold just about 1.2 million copies worldwide by the time it reached November in 1996 since its release in December of 1995. The closest console game sold at the time at the same amount of units moved was Wave Race 64 at 1.1 million. Meanwhile, Super Mario 64 was reaching near 3 million copies sold. So in order to keep going with the Warcraft series and continue to expand on it, Blizzard had to split their employees where some would go on to the next project while others took on the reign of a new project entitled StarCraft. Now initially, it was talked about as a standalone expansion for their Warcraft franchise that would be completed in 12 months and launched in 1996. In fact, the game was such an afterthought at the time that the code for StarCraft was just from their Warcraft series with updated artwork. So. It was basically just a reskin of Warcraft. The idea of StarCraft was from the perspective of what would happen if they just took their world of Warcraft and set it in space. Stop poking me! Instead of the greens and browns of the fantasy fueled world of Warcraft, the team opted for more of a space themed color palette using blends of pink, blue, and greens, which made the game look unique but also visually unappealing. Like, very unappealing. It kind of looked like a cross between Galaga and Warcraft. However, the biggest setback for Blizzard that made the StarCraft branch rework their original concept was when the team viewed another RTS game during E3 in 1996 that was just down the hall of their own presentation room, Dominion Storm. Dominion Storm looked like it was miles ahead of Blizzard's StarCraft team. From an amazing presentation room to a full-on game that just surpassed the current iteration of StarCraft by leagues, and with people already saying at E3 that StarCraft just looked like orcs in space that would really rub them the wrong way, the StarCraft team decided to go back to the drawing board. Not just in redoing their color palette, but in redoing the entire game. <laughs> So with new vigor to no longer create a game that was more of like a spin-off, the team decided StarCraft was going to become its own genre-breaking and defining game that would push boundaries like what previously happened with Warcraft Orcs and Humans. New models, new storylines, everything was remade and even though the game wouldn't go on to launch until 1998, their competitor during E3 creating Dominion Storm still launched one month after StarCraft due to financial and political problems. The studio in charge of Dominion Storm, Ion Storm, solely came to a halt with employees leaving and seeking careers with other companies, and it was during that runoff of employees that Blizzard acquired Mark Skelton and Patrick Thomas from Ion Storm's Dominion team to work on StarCraft, where they produced the game's iconic cutscenes, most notably with the Brood War expansion in 1998. According to Skelton and Thomas, the Dominion Storm demo during 1996's E3 was actually a pre-rendered movie, and the people who showed it off were just pretending to play the game. In fact, 
the company Ion Storm acquired the game from another company called 7th Level, who sold it to them unfinished when 7th Level ceased all game development, saying it only needed $50,000 and 3 months to finish, which was not the case at all. Instead, the development for the game continued for over a year and costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, only to be launched with poor ratings and selling 7,000 copies in the first 4 months and 14,000 by November 30th, 1998. Game Spy later called the game one of the 25 dumbest moments in gaming and claiming that the game more than likely only sold less than 10,000 units during its lifespan. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy that a game that basically just didn't exist is what made StarCraft into the game that it was. Like, that's... That, that is that is insane. With the setback of starting from scratch and filled with more drive than ever, the StarCraft team went back to the drawing board and decided to not only build the game from the ground up, but to also create a game that was going to be a standalone and that brought up some problems. We need to make some serious changes. The vision was so far beyond what the technology could do at the time. We needed to redo the game engine in order to really get that vision that we had been looking for. Coding for the game could not support their new ambition. The game was running off the same engine as Warcraft with updated artwork which meant that there were restrictions to what the game could do and during that year Blizzard was already getting started on yet another upcoming project, Diablo, and more importantly, the creation of Battle.net. Currently, Battle.net hosts all of Blizzard's games with a hub of information to look through. However, during its release in 1997, the network only offered services like chatting and game listings with the ability to talk to other players and join multiplayer games of Diablo. And as important as the core game of StarCraft was, it couldn't have reached its pinnacle without Battle.net, and Diablo was going to be the first game to launch using the service. Seeing as the service was a linchpin for StarCraft, the team had to take a break and make sure Diablo would launch on their target date using Battle.net correctly, leaving the StarCraft team pretty much non-existent until Diablo was eventually finished. Until Battle.net, RTS games were in this weird lull of trying to work with the advent of the internet to connect people online through video games and still using archaic techniques to connect one player to another. Now there was another company that provided online connectivity with games through a subscription fee called Total Entertainment Network that hosted games like Command & Conquer, Duke Nukem 3D, and Quake. And it was because of this network, Blizzard wanted to create their own hub, and so Battle.net was created. But when Blizzard brought their team up to Blizzard North in acquisition from the company Condor Games, Diablo had no multiplayer connectivity to even work with Battle.net. In fact, there was absolutely no multiplayer code for the game because the team had no idea how to even write that kind of code. And so we were going to have it so you just pressed a button and you could play multiplayer over the internet. I'm like, yeah, that is awesome. Uh, okay, I guess I'm not going to write this. <laughs> so the team had to buckle down eight months before the planned release of Diablo just to come in and write the code for the game so then they could use Battle.net, a free online multiplayer hub that would connect players with each other and would force the Total Entertainment Network to transition into free, easy to play online games and becoming Pogo.com instead. Now before StarCraft and Battle.net, it was hard to figure out who was the best at a video game, let alone being able to even create something like an eSport. With some Nintendo hosted events that were more promotions for their products and fighting games being more of the standard of skill versus skill, or time-based marathons like speedrunning, there weren't a lot of ways to see who was the best of the best, and that was why StarCraft and Battle.net was so important to the history of eSports. Battle.net not only let players see who was at the top of the leaderboard in the game because of their global ladder, but it also garnered a community of players who were dedicated to becoming better and better at StarCraft. So while a majority of the employees that were on the StarCraft project had to move over to Diablo, the only person that was working on the game was a guy named Bob Fitch, who spent basically six months living inside of the offices of Blizzard to finish coding the game from the ground up. Fitch spent that entire time working up to 70 hours a week to just program StarCraft so then it would function the way they needed it to function. If it wasn't for Bob Fitch, the game probably wouldn't even exist the way it does now. Ranging from small things that you probably wouldn't notice like pathing, which was a huge point in RTS games, and since the game was coded using their Warcraft engine, they needed to make it more sophisticated and robust, so that's what 
Bob Fitch was basically there to do, adding in abilities like cloaked units, the ability to burrow underground and having units be nested within other units. And on December 31st, 1996, Battle.net launched and three months later Diablo was released to the public. Battle.net ended up reaching 1.25 million different users with 3,500 new users being added each day and by April 1999, Battle.net would reach 2.3 million active users and more than 50,000 concurrent users thanks to the release of StarCraft in 1998. Diablo would go on to sell over 500,000 copies by April of 1997 and a large majority of its success can be attributed to the use of Battle.net and now that Diablo was completed, it was time for the team to get back to work on StarCraft. However, it still needed an entire overhaul along with help with its design and direction and that's when Chris Metzen joined the StarCraft team to recreate the entire fictional concept for the game. In StarCraft, I'm the uh, Terran Battlecruiser, you know, Battlecruiser up you know, I'm the, uh... With limited time, the team decided on developing just three factions for the game. However, unlike other RTS games at the time, StarCraft was going to create three functionally different races that a player could operate. Even its predecessors in Warcraft had mirroring races, and having each race be different was going to be a challenge. The primal yet intelligent Protoss, protected with golden armor towering over the other races, the Terran, power armored and hardened humans, and the swarming insectoid Xenos race of the Zerg. The team kept tweaking the races until it was what they wanted. For example, the Zerg were originally called Zerg, but then they realized that Toy Story already had an alien race called Zerg, and so they slightly modified it to Zerg. Wraiths were originally called Phoenix, and Goliaths had flamethrowers that they onboarded onto the marine firebats instead. Having three completely different races made the game so unique to other RTS games and fleshing them out to also be balanced when fighting against each other is a feat not many people can do, let alone a team. Terran built their buildings using SCVs that would be dedicated to building. The Zerg's drones would transform themselves into the buildings that you needed. The Protoss would beam in their structures and have their drones come back to keep mining minerals. Terran and Protoss would spawn from their buildings while the Zerg hatched out of larva. Each race was so unique and different and it's what really set apart the playstyle of the game compared to the other vast majority of RTS games that were hitting stores shelves. From the game's initial conception, the developers knew they wanted to have three very distinct races and building upon those races was going to be pivotal to the success of the game. Well that and, you know, a story befitting a space opera, but that's another topic that would take another like 20 minutes to go over. So. Let's fast forward. After its release, StarCraft became the best-selling PC game of 1998, selling over 1.5 million copies worldwide. The only other game that came close to its sales in the PC market was Deer Hunter with over a million copies, but the market was still small compared to the home console market when you consider that Pokemon Red, Blue, and Green only sold uh, a little over 1 million units in its first year in Japan alone and then went on to sell over 6 million copies in the United United States during its 1998 to 1999 release. Home computers just weren't as readily available as something like a Game Boy was. In 1998, 46 million households had one or more computers in their homes. Out of that, only 19% of children ages 3 to 17 even logged onto the internet during that year. So with a home computer going for like $2,005, with inflation going up to $3,489 at the time, it was significantly cheaper cheaper to purchase a $90 Game Boy and a cartridge. Accessibility just wasn't there, but it didn't stop people from buying over a million copies of the game and turning it into a worldwide phenomenon. But there was one other reason for StarCraft's success, and that story begins in South Korea. And more specifically, 1997 during the Asian financial crisis. The U.S. chose not to intervene in Thailand, thinking it was not going to spill over. Why would it? Churches have been burned. Mosques have been attacked. They have killed each other. And it's all the fallout of 
an economic collapse. In just one month, the Korean won went from 800 to 1 USD all the way to 1700 wands to 1 USD. This was due to Thailand's currency taking a nosedive and sent most of the countries in Asia into turmoil, putting South Korea into a financial burden and with that, PC cafes became increasingly more popular. More so than they already were at the time. People had less money and so cafes let the younger people of Asia still be able to mingle and interact without having to worry too much about how much it was going to cost their parents. This led to the creation of what we now call PC bongs or internet cafes. And with the Asian financial crisis, these places became even more popular with teens and young adults where they could easily play the hottest games with their groups of friends leading to a culture surrounding the video game industry and StarCraft was a driving force for that development. At the time in Korea, the internet was already being used by more than 50% of the population, and by 2011, PC bongs would grow from 100 locations to 25,000. For reference, in California, if you took all of the big fast food chains like McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and screw it, you know, let's throw in Starbucks also, and tally them all up, you'd only have a little over 5,000 restaurants, and South Korea is four times smaller than California. South Korea has more PC bongs than California has gas stations. And to this day, StarCraft, an over 25-year-old game, is still in the top 10 most played games in an internet cafe, right above Riot Games Valorant and below Diablo 2 Resurrection. This huge influx in PC bongs created a community that flourished with the advent of the internet, and when Brood War came out, things went nuclear. StarCraft Brood War was the first official expansion pack for StarCraft. There were other projects taken up by various companies under the Blizzard umbrella like Insurrection and Retribution, but those were more spin-offs and didn't expand on StarCraft. Brood War, however, was not only just an expansion of the core game with tweaks to help balance the original, it was also, according to Bob Fitch, what the final vision of StarCraft was. Brood War introduced new units that helped balance out the game to make it fair for all sides with each race having answers to other races' strategies, introducing new units like Medics for the Terran, Dark Archons for the Protoss, and Lurkers for the Zerg. Brood War became an iconic staple for competitive video games and in 1998, Shinju Young, aka Honest, became the first recognized professional gamer in Korea by winning the Grand StarCraft Tournament, and then Boxer, and Savior, and Bisu. Korea ate up these new video game celebrities with games being broadcasted on television channels in Korea, which became the building blocks of what esports are. With Brood War out, StarCraft wouldn't get another update for nearly a decade when StarCraft 2 launched, but even with updated graphics and a sleeker look, the RTS genre has fallen to the wayside for the general public, which leads us to today. God. This is, I, I, I kid you not, one of the hardest things for Protoss to do, and probably the hardest thing for Protoss to do in the early game like this. Oh. Dude, he's just doing it! Look at this! Look at this! Look at this micro! Oh my god, he's so good! Now this could be due to a large number of events that would take another 20 minutes to discuss, ranging from the StarCraft professional scandals with their pro players in Korea dominating the eSport, to the pro scene viewer counts being outshined by other eSports like League of Legends and Counter-Strike. Sponsors have left the scene, pro players no longer being interested, poor balancing from what people expected, leading to the longest running esport organization finally shutting down its StarCraft Brood War scene, the first real esport scene in video game history in South Korea after 14 years. And although the game's glory days might be over, its legacy lives on in the modern esports of today. This is Infotasis GSL vs. The World, the all-star game of StarCraft II. We've had the eight best players from around the world against the eight best players from Korea for the last four days, and we're down to two. StarCraft started out as an afterthought, and that turned into an idea swinging for the fences. In an era that was rapidly evolving and competition was brutal, but that competition is what gave us the game we know of now. StarCraft came out at just the right time, attracted just the right people, and created the perfect game to create the storm of revolution. You mix all of that together, 
PC bongs, the advent of esports, PCs becoming more and more affordable as time went on and a group of people who were dedicated to the game to push it to new heights and you've got the juggernaut that is StarCraft. In 2020, Blizzard officially announced that they will no longer be supporting StarCraft 2. And with it comes the end of an era for the titular title. Not only did it forge memories with people waiting to get into the next lobby of fastest maps, big game hunter, or family guy, it paved the way for esports and without StarCraft, we probably wouldn't have as big of a scene for video games that we do now. And with the StarCraft franchise gone, begs the question, what game would take its place for its legacy? Oh, look at the quest, look at the moves! Faker, what was that?